we were taken to a second camp, and there my name suddenly popped up as somebody going to combat, and that's how I actually realized that I was going to war. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Nepal Now on the Move. This is the show that talks with some of the thousands of people leaving this country every month, as well as to those among the few who return to settle in their homeland. My name is Marty Logan. Of all the reasons I've heard for Nepalis migrating to work abroad, this one was the most shocking, to fight for the Russian army in its invasion of Ukraine. The news first reached the mainstream media in mid-2023. But long before that, photos of young Nepali men posing in Russian army uniforms had been circulating online. For the unemployed, or underemployed, Russia quickly became the newest, fastest way to earn foreign currency, topped up in some cases with the promise of an appealing foreign passport. But soon after, News of growing numbers of battlefield deaths began making headlines, and calls grew for the Nepal government to intervene. It did ask the Russian government to prevent recruitment, which seems to have happened in recent months, according to reports. But the government says 40 Nepalis are confirmed to have died fighting for Russia, and an even larger number of corpses are undergoing DNA tests. Today's guest, Kakendra Khatri, was planning to go work in South Korea when he was approached by a Nepali recruiter in Dang district. At first, he wasn't interested, but the man persisted for more than a month to sell him the dream. Finally, Katri agreed that the conditions offered were worth his recruiter's fee of 7 lakhs, 700,000 rupees or 5,200 US dollars, to buy a spot. Katri was told that he would be cooking for the soldiers behind the front lines. But when he got closer to the battlefield, he saw that wasn't accurate. He had been designated as a fighter. The Nepali man quickly started negotiating a way out. A quick note before we start, SLC means school leaving certificate or a grade 10 diploma. Please listen now to my chat with Kakendra Katri, recorded at Himal Media in Patandoka. His words are interpreted by Hima Rai. Kakendra Katri, welcome to Nepal Now Podcast. Dhanyavad. We want to talk about your experience going to Russia. But before we do that, I want to ask you about your early life, where you were born in Nepal, where you grew up and went to school, that kind of thing. Nepal, Namaskar. Ma Nepal Guru. Namaste, thank you. I was born in Rolpa in Ganga Devi Rural Municipality of Rolpa District. I went to the Bhagwati Basic School in the in that uh, village. So when I was in grade two, my mother passed away. Uh, then I was sent to my maternal home where I studied until grade eight. But then our financial situation was really um, hard. So I started selling vegetables since I was grade eight. And then I continued my study while selling vegetables. That was a small business that I started. Then I gave my SLC. And even after SLC, I uh, enrolled in the local plus uh, local college for my plus two studies. And I continued to do the small business. As I continued my studies while um, while doing my college, then I uh, started uh, learning Korean language because I wanted to go to Korea. But then the pandemic happened, so um, the Korean government did not open the recruitment process. So I got back to my little business. Uh, and then agents reached out to me, and they I don't know how they reached out to me, but they started luring me to go to Russia. They gave me many promises, and then that's how I uh, got recruited for Russia. When the agent first contacted me, contacted me, I was still thinking about it. So it 
took him almost one and a half months to convince me that he didn't live nearby. And so he would show me all these promises. Like he said, if I went to Russia, then he, uh, I would, wouldn't be recruited for war. Instead, he would employ me, give me employment as a cook. And then um, after that, there would be PR in one year, and then I could go to the U.S., and then he also said that the salary would be about um, three lakhs uh, Russian rupees, r- Russian currency, which is, would be about five lakh uh, in Nepali money. So after all of these purchases by him, then I kind of um, became forced to go to Russia. At this time, you did know that there was a war going on in Russia. Yes, I knew there was a war happening, but they told me that I would be hired as an army cook and not in the active war zone. So you were convinced and you made up your mind to go, and then the next step, I guess, was you had to get the money. How did you get the money, and how much money did you need to go? This was my journey, Guru Maharaj Ji. Once I decided to go to Russia, then I um, asked for loans from my relatives in the village. The agent agreed to take me um, in 7 lakh Nepali rupees, so I managed 7 lakh uh, Nepali rupees. Along with me, there were six other fellow villagers who all all of us went to Russia, but uh, among these, four are already declared dead by the Nepal government. So that's how the seven of us went to Russia after managing money, and then we went to interview in the embassy. And then after a week of doing the process, we have flown into Russia. So you came to Kathmandu to go to the embassy. Before you came to Kathmandu, did you talk to your family members and friends? And what did they say to you? Did they agree that you should go to Russia? Or were they worried about you going? My family members did not object when I was still in the village, but when I came to Kathmandu just before the interview, they had sort of said that if it's in active com- combat, please don't go. But if it's in a cook, um, we guess it's all right. And then, so you got your ticket and you went to Moscow. Moscow, Moscow, I'm like, 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 so once we landed in Moscow, then we were kept in a hotel for about one day. Then a Russian person came and dropped us off at the army camp gate. And then for about two days, they did our processing, like different forms. They also opened our bank account, and, they, and we also went through a medical. But the medical was really simple. Like That's how we spent uh, another two days. This should be beneficial to visit them, I'm like. After that, um, they drove us about roughly about 15 hours through dense forests to uh, an army camp deep within the forest. And there we had uh, some training for about a week. What kind of training was it? Talim was normal. He was doing a normal and this was a normal domi bandu pack. It was a normal sort of training. They taught us how to crawl, how to um, handle that one particular gun. So simple stuff. At that point, did you understand that you were not going to be a cook? I was not aware in that camp, but we were taken to a second camp, and there my name suddenly popped up as somebody going to combat, and that's how I actually realized that I was going to war. So you, you just saw your name on a list, and it said combat? I saw my name list, name in this list, which is forwarded in these groups. We were uh, put together in different WhatsApp groups. So in one of those, in those WhatsApp groups, everybody's name, like who will be going to which area to fight is a trap, um, is uh, given. And I saw my name in, in one such group listed as like, going to combat. Were the other Nepalis with you then, still, or were you separated? Yeah, my friends who went with me from the village were with me. Our group had about 1,300 people. About 200 of them were Indian, I think, and maybe 50, 60 were Pakistani. rest, all of us were Nepali, and so my friends were also along with me till that time. Sorry, just to clarify. 1,300 in the total group, 200 Indian, about 50 Pakistani. 
not a thousand were Nepalese. Around a thousand and fifty three were Nepali in that group. Oh, I thought there was only fifty Nepalis there. It's only in my group that there was about 1053, but I think in total in Russia there were about 13,000 Nepalis at that point. So then you found out your name was on the list to go to combat, then what happened after? After I saw my name, I was to go to the war in day after tomorrow. So then I started um, talking with who looked like an important person out there through the user transla- translator. I started persuading him. He was not listening to me at the beginning, but then I, like, I talked and talked with him for almost a day and a half. And then he agreed after uh, there were seven of us who wanted to get out. So we each paid him 17,000 ruble. And then he dropped us off in his own vehicle, some five kilometers out of that camp. And from there, we started walking through the jungle. And that's how we got out. So a senior commander, a senior official, actually took them out in his own car after he paid the money. He took you five kilometers away from the camp. And then what happened? this was after he dropped us off uh, five kilometers out of the camp, it was 12 at midnight, we then started walking. I think we walked for about 16, 17 hours. And the next day, around 5 or 6 p.m., we found a vehicle which was going to Moscow. You were walking on the road or through the forest? So we are still walking through the forest. There was a road, a drivable road, but there were no villages, no people. It was still within the forest. How were you feeling then? Like, Were you relieved that you got away or were you scared that someone might see you and take you back? We did not fear that somebody would come and snatch us back that much, but we are more afraid of wild animals, and if we found any wild animals, what they would do. And it was also snowing, so another fear was that maybe we would just perish in the cold. So the car that you met, was it like a private car or a bus? Bus, I had a personal car. I had a personal car. I had a personal car. So the vehicle we came across was um, a private car. It was um, of a Russian person. And then we stopped uh, stopped it and then talked uh, to him through translate. And then he agreed to drop us off to Moscow. He must have been very surprised to see you. It's quite a remote place, right? <laughs> So he was quite shocked to see us. Even before we stopped him, he actually stopped his vehicle after seeing us. And then we talked with him um, using Translate. And we, we said that, oh, we had actually come here for work, but then we were sent to war zone. And then he decided to, um, to give us a lift to Moscow. So he drove you to Moscow. How long did it take to go to Moscow? And then what happened after you got there? I mean, Moscow was not seven hours. We drove uh, for seven hours. Once we reached Moscow, we wanted to pay him, but he didn't accept it. And he dropped us off at a hostel, which he he knew, because our visa was already expired at that point. So he made sure that we were safe. And after a day, we called our friends and family back home, and they sent us some money. And then we purchased our tickets and flew out the very next day. Before you got your tickets and left, were you worried when you were sitting in Moscow that the officials would find you or army people were looking for you. How are you feeling? Yes, I was very afraid because um, for those people who had ran away, if they found them, they were taking them back. For example, a few Indians had also escaped just before us, and we heard that they were taken back to the camp. So yes, uh, we were really afraid of that, of them finding us out, catching us, and taking us back to war. And did you contact the Nepal embassy? 
So yeah, we didn't contact the embassy. We just asked one of our friends in from Nepal to purchase our tickets, and then when we got our ticket, we just went directly to airport and came back home. How many days were you in Russia total? Mele niste. I spent a total of nineteen days in Russia. When I'm sitting here talking to you, you look very calm. But when you think about it and you tell the story like you told us now. How do you feel about what happened to you there? I just thought it was a story like that. I just thought it was a story. Right now, as I retell my story, it feels it it actually feels like a story, and maybe people don't believe it. But when I was actually there, I was really afraid. One thought in the back of my mind was that maybe I wouldn't make it home. Oh, that this is it. Like I'm going to die here. So I used to think uh, those thoughts. So. It was really dangerous at that time, but now when I say it, it does feel like just a deal. What are you thinking about now in terms of Russia? Are you worried about getting your money back, or are you worried about finding the person who kind of tricked you to go to Russia? Are you worried about your friends who are still there? Like, what are you thinking about Russia and this experience now? So after I came back from Russia, I worked as a security guard for about six months. But then I have started an agriculture farm. So maybe uh, something will happen out of that farm. And my parent, my father, my sisters are worried about me, and I'm also really worried. I also have to somehow pay the loan, and I think about how to pay our loan every day. So regarding the agents, I tried to contact one of them repeatedly, but I was not able to. And so we, um, I've also lost a case against the agents who sent me there. And one of the person, actually one of the agents, has already been uh, apprehended, and he's been sent to. Jail for 17 years for under human trafficking. So there's that. But my uh, pr- prominent thought is I have to support my family. My sisters and father are really worried about me. So maybe if I get to go to a better country, a nice country, then maybe I could clear my loan and also support my family. So I've been thinking about that a lot. So one of the agents got arrested in Kathmandu. Is he in jail in Kathmandu? Was the case in Kathmandu? They arrested him in Kathmandu, and he is in a jail in Kathmandu. Were you involved in that case? Like, did you go to court, or they just used your statement? Case carry with him. I'm in Malaysia, and this was your doing. Me, along with four other um, my friends who were deceased, their families had lost a case against that person, and yes, we went to court and everything. The farm that you said you started is it also in Kathmandu, or where is that? The rural farm. My farm is in Rolpa. And is it making any profit yet or not yet? So our family had just started the farm, and so I'm hopeful that uh, maybe in the next two three months we'll start making some profits. So the debt that you owe for going to Russia uh, is it seven lakh? Is that how much money you have owing? So the farm cost an additional three four lakh. So I think I have about nine ten lakh rupees debt right now. And you don't think that you could make enough money here in Nepal to pay off that debt, even if the farm goes very well? Farm all marketing that they want and want to carry them in the business of society. Farm might be profitable, but one never knows with the marketing in Nepal. Even if we are able to produce, maybe I, my goods wouldn't find market, so I wouldn't want to take that risk. So now you're thinking about going somewhere else overseas to work. Which countries are you thinking of? I listen to the Sikkim as an hour. I'm looking to see the Myanmar or Tripoli. Yeah, so I haven't um, decided upon any one country yet. But now I'll start talking with Manpower, and if it's a good opportunity in a good country, I will certainly go. Back at the beginning, if we go back to you finished your school, you finished your plus two, you were studying, you wanted to go to Korea, and then the agent came and talked to you about Russia. But before that, when you were planning to go to Korea, 
Did you feel like you really absolutely had to go to Korea to make money, to make your livelihood? Or was it just something that sounded interesting with good money? Or did you ever think of just staying in Nepal and doing your farming instead of going abroad? So during that time, my family was going through a lot of financial hardship. And um, I, we also had a stepmother. My father had remarried. And things were not very well in the family. So I felt like the one solution for me would be to go abroad and earn a lot of money. So I was kind of, uh, it was uh, not my desire, but it was kind of my compulsion to go abroad. So when you think about going uh, abroad again now, wherever you go, do you ever think that it's possible something could happen like happened in Russia? Do you worry that maybe you get tricked and someone will take you somewhere else, not the place you plan to go? Yes, um, I'm, I'm afraid of that. And it's, I think it's normal to think that way. But then I again feel like, oh, if I only choose countries which has agreement with Nepal government, maybe I won't be tricked again. So that's how I, I think about it. Yeah, but I'm afraid of repeating that again. All of your friends, all the people you know your age, roughly, do they all feel like they need to go overseas to work? Or are there some who are able to make a living and make enough money here in Nepal? So most of my friends, even those um, who have attempted to do something in Nepal, I've seen them failing and finally having to go abroad. And I don't think I've ever seen any of my friends actually succeed in Nepal. Is there anything else you want to say about all of this? I'll just say this to, my, to anybody who's listening, Nepali people, please don't go to Russia, whatever your agency, please just don't go. People from all over the world, please just don't go to Russia. I want to say only that. Okay. Well, thank you very much for coming and telling your story. Uh, I'm sorry it happened, but I'm glad that you're here and you're able to tell your story, and I hope that you have lots of success in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again to Kakendra Khatri for coming into the studio to speak with me today. What are your thoughts about our chat? Send us a text message by clicking on the link at the top left of the notes to this or any episode. It's a U.S. number, so from Nepal it'll cost you about 8 rupees. You can also email me at nepalnowpod at gmail.com or message us on our social channels. We're at nepalnowpod. That's all for now. I'll talk to you next time.